Joshua 24. And uh, we're just going to be looking at two verses this morning in the message. And I want to speak to you under this title this morning, A Call to Choose. A Call to Choose. As I was speaking of a while ago, uh, when we come to the starting of a new year as we are uh, yesterday and today is still really early on in the new year, of course, uh, there's almost always an urge within us, a passion within us that rises up about this time of year, sometimes even at the ending of the previous year, uh, that we desire a fresh start, that we desire a new beginning as we start a new season of life. And uh, the truth is we do get that chance every day. I mean, uh, the Lord uh, tells us that His mercies are new every morning. The Bible confirms that to us. Uh, but in all reality, there is an extra passion, I would say, that uh, we want to get it right, a, a passion for reformation, you might say, that kicks in inside our spirit, inside our soul when we come to a new year. Very common uh, to talk about New Year's resolutions, uh, resolutions uh, actually, and uh, ways we can form new and better habits in our life for the weeks and months that lay ahead of us. But as I said just a moment ago, I want to propose to you that the best New Year's resolution you can have for 2022 is to make the choice. Uh, nobody's going to stop you. You're going to go all in with God. Without question, without hesitation, the greatest need each one of us have in our life is for a strong commitment to cultivating a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not casual not occasional, not in one week and then maybe not the next week. No, I'm talking about a passionate, committed, sold out love relationship with Jesus Christ that takes you deeper and deeper into the mind and ways and will of God for your life. And right now we've got all 363 days, you might say, after today ahead of us. And uh, they all have great potential they all have great uh, responsibility to us that we would use our days as God would have us to. The book of James talks about uh, that life is but a vapor. It's here for a while and then vanishes away. David talked about uh, my life is like a hand breath. Just um, seem like I'm here and then before you know it, I'm already over to here. Life is short. I believe it's either in the Psalms or the book of James 1. Maybe in the Psalms it talks about teach us to number our days that we may apply wisdom. So see, beyond the shadow of any doubt, the best choice you can make in this new year is to go all in with God. And that's what we need, a determination to serve Him with a true and undivided heart. And that's what the Lord desires for our lives. Now the scriptures we're going to read this morning come from Joshua 24. And this passage here in the 24th chapter here, uh, before this and then through, we're going to read 14 and 15 in this chapter. And uh, these verses come from Joshua's last charge to Israel before his death. He gathers them together and really begins to kind of give them some closing instructions, you might say, before his death. And uh, Joshua here is not speaking his own words. He's not speaking of his own volition or his own opinion. Verse 2 in that chapter tells us that he is speaking what thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I mean, this is a word from God he's telling the people. He begins to remind them in this chapter how that God has helped them and delivered them over and over in the past. He mentions names like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He mentions occurrences, miracles really, of the parting of the Red Sea, things like that. Uh, the uh, walls of Jericho, the victory that happened there, among other things. And he was trying to remind the people about how good God had been to them in the past. But still, even though God had come to their rescue, had been good to them, had delivered them over and over, there was still a tendency in the people of God here to waver, to waver among God's people. And uh, they were trying to, I guess a modern day way to say it would be they were trying to ride the fence. They were trying to get some of both worlds, you might say. 
And Joshua knew that they needed some encouragement and some admonition in order to make up their minds to stop wavering, to stop halting between two opinions, and we'll talk about that some, but to make the decision to serve God with every fiber of their being. So if you're ready, let's read in Joshua chapter 24 and uh, look at verses 14 and 15. It says, Now therefore, fear the Lord. That's what Joshua was telling the children of Israel, and it's good words for us as well. Therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Just dig your heels in and serve the Lord with all your heart. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, and that's little g gods you'll notice. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. And I think you could say this with me. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I want to talk to you this morning about a call to choose. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And now, Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. I pray that you would speak to our hearts in a way only you can. Pray that you would anoint me to say just the words you'd have me to, nothing more, nothing less, and would you speak to our hearts in a powerful way. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen to what God said through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. What the prophet Elijah, listen to what he said to the uh, prophets of the false god Baal. He said in 1 Kings 18 and verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people, and here's what he said, uh, and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, Follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. I'm afraid we hear that a lot in the world today, symbolically speaking, that people won't make up their mind. Uh, if, we, you know, if we were to say like Elijah, if God be God, follow him. If the world be who you follow, follow them. But they just kind of don't, they just try not to say a word and just kind of shove it under the rug, you might say. Uh, God had a strong admonition for the church at Laodicea. This will be a familiar scripture to you. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. He said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, kind of riding the fence there, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. God says, you're disgusting to me because you're lukewarm. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Then one of my favorite verses, that is in re all reality, the solution to lukewarm Christianity. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I want to ask you a question, or maybe a series of questions here this morning. Would you say that you're sold out to God? Just be honest. Would you say that you are truly on fire for God as you're going in to this new year? Would you feel truthful to say that you're really passionate about the things of God? What if I asked your family? What if I asked your friends? What would they say? Would you believe that they would say what they would say? Uh, what about if I asked them, would they say hot? Would they say cold? Would they say lukewarm? Why do you think they would say that? What you're thinking in your mind? Or would they say, oh my goodness, they are so passionate about serving God. If they wouldn't say that, why do you think they wouldn't? Why do you think they wouldn't? The simple fact is this. We're all as close to God 
as we choose to be. I'll say that again. We're all as close to God as we choose to be. You might say, well, I used to be close to God, but somehow things are not clicking like they used to. Well, I'll say this, and it sounds a little facetious, but it's, a little, it's something we need to think about. If you feel that way, who do you think moved? Who do you think moved? It certainly wasn't God. He said, I change not. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. God's still right where he's always been. But many times we as human beings have a tendency to drift, to move away. Sometimes even to walk at a, uh, what Johnny Hunt would call a guilty distance from God. A guilty distance. The free will of man can be a beautiful thing, but also with that free will, we have the choice to choose and sometimes man in his free will does not choose the best choices, we might would say. So in the end, we're as close to God as we choose to be. So times like these especially are a wonderful opportunity to ask yourself the question. Get real honest between you and God and ask the question, how serious am I really in my walk with God? How dedicated and devoted am I to following God's will for my life every day? How passionate am I about following God and serving Him? Now, not just at church, not just when you're around Christian friends or uh, church family members. What about when you're just at home, maybe with your immediate family? What about when you're on the job? What about when it's just you and God? When it's just no other person around. What about in your thought life? Are you really serious about serving God down to your core, in your heart, in your mind? Uh, the Bible tells us, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. How dedicated am I to following the Lord wholeheartedly in every single area of my life? I want to tell you that I believe there are three major areas of consequence, particularly that come when we live life on the fence, when we live life inconsistently. Some people have what you might call a divided loyalty. Divided loyalty. Uh, they don't feel like they're necessarily far away from God, but uh, they're sure not following Him either. It's a divided loyalty. They're going back and forth. They're halting between two opinions, as Elijah would call it. One day maybe this, one day maybe the other. And then it gets to be after a while where mostly it's the other. They don't uh, stay with the Lord. Uh, some people have what you might call a ruptured allegiance. I, I think that's a good term for it. A ruptured allegiance. They have run with the world so much that they've blown their allegiance. They've blown it. Then now their loyalty is divided between two different worlds. God and the evils of the world. The compromise of the world. Another word I like to use is compartmentalize. We try to compartmentalize our life and say, this is my God compartment, uh, this is my home compartment, this is my job compartment, and I'll just open this one up when I come to church, I'll uh, close that when I get done at church, and I'll open up a different compartment at home, and then maybe open up a different compartment when I go to the job. It's the, it, living different lives. That, there's a word for that, and it's hypocrisy. I mean, it, we're not the same. we we got to be authentic and real, the same wherever we are. Because God is wherever we are. He's seeing it all, no matter if we're at church, no matter if we're at home, no matter if we're at work, the store, whatever it might be. It's inconsistent to live in that way. And the Bible truth is, is that there are major consequences to living your life in such a fashion. Living your life on the fence, halting between two opinions. Here's those three major consequences that I would want to tell you about. Number one, divided loyalty has eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. Now, you may think that you can handle that little bit of sin that tries to creep into your life, that little bit of compromise. You think, oh, I can handle it. It won't, it won't uh, get the best of me, and I'll throw it out right before I have to uh, leave this life. But uh, we need to know this morning that we can't manage sin. 
Uh, Johnny Hunt has said it like this. Sin is never satisfied with the amount of you it possesses. Boy, that's true. It may start in one area of your life. And then before you know it, it'll spread into another area of life and then another area. And before you know it, your whole life will become infected with that compromise, with that sin. And the truth of the Bible is if you don't deal with sin, sin will deal with you. And it will ultimately lead you to alter your eternal destiny. The Bible tells us that sin separates us from God. The Bible also tells us that sin can never enter heaven. There are eternal consequences to a divided loyalty. I tell you, when we flirt with sin, when we flirt with the world, we're going to regret it. We're going to regret it. Uh, you know, in the natural, we would think it would be very inappropriate for a married man to begin flirting with a woman that's not his wife. We would think that very inappropriate, uncalled for, uh, just a terrible thing. And I would say that the greatest majority of the time, if that attraction is not dealt with and it's allowed to take over that person's emotions, it'll lead to adultery. The greatest majority of the time if it's not dealt with. In the same way, when we have divided loyalty, when we're uh, riding on the fence, we're flirting with the world. In the same way as a married man flirting with another woman. We are allowing the attraction to the world to take over our emotions and our reasoning. And ultimately, it will lead to spiritual adultery if it's not dealt with. You see, as a child of God, I shouldn't be flirting with the world. Why? Because I'm already married. I'm already married. As a Christian, the Bible tells me that as a Christian, I'm the bride of Christ. So any flirting with the world is inappropriate. And it can and likely will lead to spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. I tell you, divided loyalty has eternal consequences. Secondly, I would tell you that divided loyalty has personal consequences. Personal consequences. Just to name a few. Uh, your prayers are hindered. Your prayers are hindered. Uh, you'll be unstable. In life, Psalm 1 talks about how that the ungodly are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. In other words, chaff, it just takes next to nothing to, to throw you off. Takes next to nothing to get you anxious. Takes next to nothing to get you unstable and wavering in life. So you'll be unstable. Uh, you'll lose the peace of God. What a gift the peace of God is. You'll lose it. You'll lose it if you begin to ride the fence. Uh, you will forsake the joy that comes from your walk with God. The joy of serving Him. That's why you see so many people that call themselves Christians. Just running around, going here in different places. Just looking for happiness. They're going everywhere, trying everything, doing everything. And what they're doing is they're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Trying to find joy. Trying to find peace trying to find happiness, trying to find satisfaction. When, it, when The truth is, if they'll just go with God, if they'll just press in and follow the Lord with all their heart, He promises joy unspeakable and full of glory. He promises a peace that passes understanding, a love that's an everlasting love. Why would we ever want to throw that away for temporary earthly pleasures that draw us away from God? Why would we want to throw away those wonderful things? Divided loyalty has personal consequences. And then the third thing I would tell you is divided loyalty has generational consequences. And boy, this is important. Generational consequences. I think about these verses in Exodus 20. It's a passage from the uh, uh, famed Ten Commandment passage. Exodus chapter 20, starting at verse 2. Uh, he says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Now listen, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity, that is the sin, of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. I think we could rightly say the principle applies to father or mother. The parents, the sins are visited down. The father has a big responsibility, but the mother does as well. It's passed down generationally uh, to the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So you see our divided loyalty, our halting between two opinions has generational consequences. It doesn't just affect us, not just our life. It affects those who are coming up after us. The sins of the fathers are carried to the third and fourth generation after them. Think of the flip side in Proverbs 20 and verse 7. It says, the just man, in other words, the godly man, walketh in his integrity, his children are blessed after him. They're blessed. So you see, you have the choice of what you're going to leave to those coming up after you. Now, I'm not talking about your, your money, your house, your possessions, your car. All, I'm not talking about all that. I'm talking about the spiritual legacy or lack thereof that you leave to the generations that are coming up behind you. Listen, do you want the sins of your life to be visited on your children and grandchildren? Or do you want the blessings of your godly life, your holy living to be visited on your children and your grandchildren? You see, because sin and compromise has the potential to destroy generation after generation after generation until somebody gets enough courage to break the chain, to break the cycle and set a new normal for the family. Listen, you owe it to your family to serve the Lord with gladness. You owe it to your grandchildren to be all in for God. You, sir, you, ma'am, you, my friend, you are setting the tone for the generations to come. Oh, it's so true. God forbid that we ever forget it. We are setting the tone for the generations to come. May we always live with the sensitivity to what we're leaving behind for those who are coming after us. Heard a quote one time. It's just phenomenal, I believe. It says, legacy is not leaving something for people. It's leaving something in people. And I'll tell you, uh, what better thing can you leave in people than a hunger and thirst for righteousness? A hunger and thirst for God. Divided loyalty has generational consequences. So now the question is, how does it happen? How do you do it? How do you go all in with God and serve Him with every fiber of your being? Well, the truth is, it's not uh, just a quick fix type of a thing. It's going to be a lifelong process that we must follow Him every day of our life. Uh, uh, influence is built over time. Uh, our uh, character is built over time. But there are some decisions that we must make every day in order to go all in with God. And uh, you can talk about a lot of things here that I believe would be important, but I'm going to limit it to just three things. Three things, three choices that you must make every day if you're going to go all in with God. This is kind of how Joshua sums it up in the verses that we read. And I will guarantee you, that if you will do these three things every day, you will make these three choices and you will persist, persevere, and be diligent in them, you'll find yourself drawing near to God. You will find yourself getting closer to Him. You won't be able to help but to go, in all, go all in with God. So three choices that you must make every day. Number one, if we want to go all in with God every day, I must choose to fear the Lord. I must choose to fear the Lord. Look back at Joshua 24 and verse 14. It says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. That's what, it, that's what it is. Every day I must choose to fear the Lord. And I'll tell you what, if everybody on this earth could get a hold of this principle, what a difference it would make. What a difference it would make. Uh, to fear the Lord... It's really a reverence and a respect for Him. If you fear God, it means that you take Him seriously. 
It means you take God seriously. The fear of the Lord doesn't mean that we're frightened to communicate with Him or to be with Him. Uh, he says we can come to the throne boldly. We can come uh, freely, you might say. Uh, the fear of the Lord just means that we have a reverence and a respect for Him and we take Him seriously. When He says something is wrong, we take that seriously. When He says we need to do something, we take that seriously. Just like we reverence and respect electricity, the power of electricity, we take it seriously. In other words, we play by its rules and not make up our own. We play by God's rules and not make up our own. We got to play by the rules of electricity and make up our own. The story is told of a man that uh, needed to unclog uh, his shower head. And he took a little straight pin and uh, there, were some, there were some calcium deposits that had built up on the uh, head, the shower head there in his shower. And uh, he took a little straight pin and began to clean out those calcium deposits that made it where it wouldn't flow good and uh, water was having a hard time getting out in a very strong way. And so he cleaned it out with a straight pin and he knew he might have to do it again because of the um, quality of the water he had. And so he uh, wanted to store the straight pin somewhere there around the shower because he thought, well, I'll need it again. I'll just store it somewhere here around the shower. Well, he noticed some, uh, some light bulbs in the bathroom that had a wire with a rubber coating uh, going between the light bulbs, kind of a decorative type of a thing. And he just thought to himself, well, I'll just stick that, um, something like this, I'll just stick that straight pin there in the rubber uh, or at, that, at that wire, that rubber coating, and I'll just stick that little straight pin in there and uh, I'll know where it is next time when I need to do this. Well, you can guess what happened. That, that's what he did. And the next thing he remembered was waking up on the floor with the shower curtain wrapped around him. You see, what he had done was he had encountered real electricity. And he had a fresh respect for its power. You see, when we recognize and encounter the real God, and I, I am talking about the real God, not just some God we make up in our minds that nothing offends and nothing is wrong. and all. That's not the real God. When we encounter the real God, when we get serious about serving Him, then we must have a fresh reverence, a fresh respect for His power and His presence and what He would have us do and what He would have us not do. In other words, you must fear the Lord and you must take Him seriously. Yet so many people... They refuse to get real with the Lord and take Him seriously. And they wonder why they wind up on the floor one day with their circumstances wrapped all around them, entangling them up. You know, it's amazing how much blessing is tied to this principle of fearing the Lord. Proverbs 9.10, just hear a few verses. Proverbs 9.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days. In other words, it'll, it'll lengthen your life. But the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Proverbs 14, 26, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Proverbs 22 and verse 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor in life. Psalm 33, 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear Him, upon them that hope in His mercy. His eye is upon you. Uh, Psalm 34 and 7, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him and delivereth them. Uh, Psalm 34, verse 9, O fear the Lord, ye His saints, for there is no want to them that fear Him. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When I fear Him, I take Him seriously, there will be no lack. There will be no lack in my life that God won't provide. Psalm 25, 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will shew them His covenant. Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Psalm 145, 19. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear Him. He also will hear their cry. And will save them. And one more here, Psalm 103, 11. For as the heaven is high above the earth, 
So great is his mercy toward them that fear him. I don't know about you, but I choose to fear the Lord. I want to fear the Lord. What great blessing there is in fearing the Lord. And not only that, not only is it just the blessing, it pleases God when we fear him. Psalm 147 in verse 11 tells us, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. That's what happens when we take God seriously. It gives him pleasure. When we hold God at first place in our life, and we don't let anything get before him. And here's what it looks like. Proverbs 8, 13 tells us that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. That's what the Lord says. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. You know, what did Joseph say when, he was, uh, uh, when Potiphar's wife was tempting him to commit immorality with her? He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He wasn't worried about what she thought. He wasn't worried about what his friends thought. He wasn't uh, thinking if others would accept him or not. He was worried about what God thought. Joseph feared God. And he knew that God wouldn't be pleased with him. Joseph hated the evil way. He hated the compromise of the world. And I'll tell you the truth. A lot of bad decisions can be eliminated in our life by simply asking the question, can I do this and still be fearing the Lord? Can I say this and still be fearing the Lord? Can I go to this place and still be fearing the Lord? Can I make this purchase? Can I take this job and still be fearing the Lord? So much is wrapped up in this principle of fearing the Lord. Some people might say, boy, I wish I had more wisdom. Uh, just, I, I wish I had more wisdom to know how to live my life. Scripture said a moment ago, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. There's no limit to what God can do in our life when we simply fear the Lord and we serve Him in sincerity and in truth. We just need to pray uh, with the psalmist in Psalm 86 and 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart. Unite my heart to fear thy name. If we want to go all in with God every day, number one, I must choose to fear the Lord. Secondly, every day, I must choose to forsake idols. To forsake idols. He said in the latter part of Joshua 24, or the middle part rather, and put away the gods which your fathers served. Little g, the idols, you might say, which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. 1 Corinthians 10 and 14 tells us, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Put away the gods. Put away the idols. You say, well, what is an idol? Here, here's a, uh, a definition I think would be pretty clear of an idol. An idol is anything that gets higher priority in our life than God does. Anything you let get higher priority in your life than God gets. In the Old Testament, uh, idols many times took the form of graven images. But in today, uh, many times idols take the form of graven priorities. Priorities that are not in the right place. And you're not fearing God, by the way, when that happens. We must get our priorities right. And uh, many times, the reason we get idols in our lives is simply because we won't deny ourselves. We won't deny ourselves. Luke 9, 23 tells us that Jesus said, if any man will come after me, uh, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Follow the Lord. You think about it. Uh, most idols can be traced back to you wouldn't deny yourself. An idol of addiction in somebody's life. It, they won't deny themselves. They won't deny themselves. Uh, an idol of immorality, maybe adultery, fornication, things of that nature, lust. It springs up when someone's life becomes an idol. They won't deny themselves. If, if, you're, if you're making your money your idol, you're refusing to deny yourself. When fun and entertainment becomes an idol, getting higher priority than God, 
then you're refusing to deny yourself. Anything that gets higher priority in our life than God and our relationship with Him, it's an idolatrous thing. And you're ripe for a harvest of idols in your life when you refuse to deny yourself. Every day, I must choose to forsake idols. Did you know even your health can become an idol if you place greater importance on your health than on your relationship with God? I must make the choice that nothing is going to get higher priority in my life than God gets. And you know, the amazing thing about it is, you know, you say, well, I've tried before, and boy, I just, you know, I just can't quite get it clicking. I just, you know, I can't quite seem to stick with it. The amazing thing is, when we go all in with God, and we have a passion to serve Him, our passion is met with His power to do it. Our passion for serving Him is met with His power and ability to be able to do it. But we've got to stick with it. We got to go all in. Our passion is met with his power, and we just have to surrender and go all in. What did Jesus say? He said something to this effect If any man would save his life, he'll lose it. But if he loses his life for my sake and the gospels, he'll save it. Isn't that something? If we try to, to uh, uh, keep our life the way we think it needs to be and we try to just you know, be concerned about us and not be concerned about a relationship with God or church or uh, you know, anything else about God, then uh, we, we will lose our life, spiritually speaking. But if we will lose our life and we will abandon our own control, give up control to Jesus and go all in with him, we will gain it. We will find life and fulfillment that we didn't even know was possible. You see, every day we got to choose to forsake idols. And then finally, number three, number three, every day I must choose to stay in the ark. Oh, to stay in the ark. And I'll explain what I'm talking about there. Look at back at verse uh, 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. He's saying you got to dig your heels in. You got to make up your mind and serve the Lord with all your heart. Serve ye the Lord. Every day I must choose to stay in the ark. And I say it that way because of something that came to my mind just the other day. You know, when Noah built the ark, uh, he did that at the command of God because destruction was coming. There would be a flood upon the whole earth, and nobody would make it out alive. Wait a minute. Unless you were in the ark. Unless you were in the ark. The Bible tells us that there were only eight people that were saved alive on the earth uh, that was when it was destroyed by flood. You know who they were? It was Noah. It was Noah's wife. It was his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and his three sons' wives. Okay, eight people. And you know why those eight people were saved? They were saved because they chose to get on the ark and stay on the ark. That's why they were saved. Uh, there's really no record here that Noah took them by force, made them get on the ark or anything. No, no, the Lord had commanded, the Lord had commanded it. But uh, from all indication, they had to make the choice to obey. They had to make the choice to get on the ark and stay on the ark. And as a result, their lives were saved from destruction. And today, we have got to choose, first of all, to get in the ark if we haven't. But then after that, every day, we got to choose to stay on the ark. God's ark of salvation is what I'm talking about. And only those who have made the choice to stay on the ark will be saved. And you know what? There's two good reasons you need to be on the ark. Number one is that one of these days, the enemy is going to come in like a flood in your life. And if you're not on the ark, uh, the Lord can't raise up a standard against it very well if you're not on the ark. And you're going to be vulnerable to attack. You're going to be vulnerable to what the devil would want to wreak havoc in your life when you're not on the ark. See, there is great protection for them that fear the Lord. There are the angel of the Lord and campeth round about them that fear the Lord. If you, go, if you want the spirit of the Lord to raise up a standard to protect you from the wiles of the devil, 
you first got to be on the ark. So that's one good reason. Second reason is that one of these days, God's going to shut the door. God's going to shut the door. And there will be no more opportunity to get on the ark. The Bible tells us that when those eight people uh, were on the ark, everything was in place, all the animals and so forth, everything was in place. It says, and the Lord shut him in. And the Lord shut him in. There is coming a day when the door of salvation will no longer be open. Uh, we will have had time to make our choice. And whatever we choose will be the choice of our eternal destiny. One day there will be no more opportunity to get right with the Lord. Can't you just imagine all of those people that didn't listen to Noah. The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Can you imagine all those people that did not listen? And then when it started to rain, can't you just imagine how they ached in their heart when the door was shut and they couldn't get on the ark? They couldn't be saved. Maybe they'd ignored the warnings. Maybe they'd just put it off till a more convenient time. But by then, it was too late. That's why it is so crucial, so crucial that we choose this day, this day, whom we will serve. We got to get on the ark and we got to stay on the ark. Every day I must choose to stay on the ark because one day our opportunity to choose will be over. We used to sing a song uh, many years ago, hadn't sung it in a while, said uh, it's time to choose whose side you're going to be on. It's time to choose. Will you have a friend to depend on? And when the battle's ended, will he say, welcome in? Or some of the worst words, the worst words you could ever hear, depart from me. I never knew you. You should have made your choice back then. It's time to choose. So it's a call to choose. Would you give up living your own way? Would you give up your divided loyalty? Give up compromise with the world. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Fear the Lord. Serve Him in sincerity and truth. Put away the idols and stay on the ark. And then you can say along with Joshua, as for me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a call to choose whose side are you going to be on.